my name is Dr. Carla Klein. I'm a neurologist. I specialize in epilepsy. And I'll be talking today about ketogenic diet in the treatment of epilepsy. Our ketogenic diet is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Uh, you may know it under the name of Atkins diet. Uh, Atkins diet contains approximately 50% of all calories from fat. Uh, it is done in three phases. In the first phase, which is about two weeks, the carbohydrates are restricted to 20 grams a day. The second phase, which is called transitional, uh, is about 40 to uh, 50 uh, carbohydrates uh, uh, per day. And then it goes into maintenance phase, which is roughly f uh, 50 to 150 grams of carbohydrates per day. Uh, a uh, more restricted form of uh, this diet is used in the treatment of the history of uh, the treatment is very interesting. Uh, so it goes back to biblical times uh, where uh, in Mark there's a description uh, of Jesus uh, seeing the son of a man who comes up to him uh, and asks him to heal his son. And his son appears to be having a, what's called grand mal seizure, unconscious, shaking, foaming. And Jesus says, uh, this can be treated by nothing but fast and prayer. Uh, fast forward to about 1910. Uh, there was a physician in upstate uh, Michigan who was a general practitioner and had a patient, a young girl, with bad epilepsy. At that time, there weren't really any good treatments for epilepsy. Uh, there was a treatment uh, that was discovered in 1850s uh, called triple bromide salts, uh, and that was pretty much it. Well, this physician thought about what he could do for this girl and went back to how epilepsy used to be treated in, pa in the past. And in Middle Ages, the treatment for epilepsy was prayer. And this physician thought about what it was in prayer, other than uh, divine intervention, that could have helped epilepsy. Well, in medieval times, prayers were commonly, when they were intense, associated with fasting. And just like in the Bible, uh, this physician decided that he'd try that treatment. And so he fasted the girl, and lo and behold, her seizures went away. He fasted it for three weeks. At the end of three weeks, the parents said, we can't do this anymore. So he stopped and these seizures came back. But this led to another uh, person, an osteopath, uh, who heard about it, thinking about what in the fast could have been responsible for this uh, effect on seizures, this beneficial effect on seizures. When you think about it, what do we live off when we fast? We live off the fat of our body. So this osteopath thought, well, maybe it is the change of diet from the ordinary to purely fat sourced calories. And he, in around about 1920, uh, research began to be done at various places, including the Mayo Clinic and Harvard, to see whether that was the case. And indeed, it is shown to be the case. And ketogenic diet began to be used very widely as treatment for epilepsy. And it was used widely during 1920s and 1930s. At the end of 1930s, a new, very effective medication was discovered, phenytoin, and the use of ketogenic diet and that was the case uh, until about 1960s, 70s, when at Johns Hopkins University, the diet continued to be used and then was resurrected uh, in a substantive way in 1980s and then in a major way in 1990s. In 1980s, there was uh, a major boost to the use of the diet with a film called First Do No Harm, which featured Marilyn Streep. Uh, that film, which is based on real life story, uh, features a young boy who has horrible epilepsy that does not respond to any other treatment 
and the parents having been everywhere in desperation uh, go to Hopkins to start this ketogenic diet to give it a try as the thing of last resort and the diet works and it's a real life story that child has been seizure free uh, since uh, 1980s until now gone through college education and been a life success story so in 1990s, uh, the diet started to be used more in children, in 2000s, more so still. Uh, the diet as it is used in epilepsy uh, consists of either 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 ratio by weight of fat to combined proteins and carbohydrates. So you have 3 grams of, uh, 3 ounces of fat for one ounce combined of protein or carbohydrate and restriction of carbohydrates per, to 20 grams per day. That's one form of the diet, uh, a commonly used one. Another one is called 4 to 1 ratio whereby you've got 4 ounces of fat to 1 ounce combined of carbohydrate and protein. So these two forms of diet, the 3 to 1 and 4 to 1 ratios are called classic ketogenic diet and those are the ones that were used initially. Uh, subsequently, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, there have been further developments. Uh, one, which was again started at Johns Hopkins University, called the Modified Atkins Diet, where basically you use the Atkins Diet as it is during the initiation phase, but you stay with the 20 grams or less of carbohydrates per day forever. Uh, couple of other forms of diet, again, all on the theme of high fat, low carbohydrates, are uh, medium triglyceride chain diet and low glycemic index diet. Uh, all these diets have been used in children and have been used successfully. And now there are uh, ketogenic diet centers for treatment of epilepsy, primarily in children all over the world. Uh, it was thought that the diet was too difficult to do for adults. When you think about it, those three to one uh, ratio ketogenic diets have 87% of calories uh, derived from fat. The four to one ratio have 90% of calories derived from fat. So that's an awful lot of fat. And how do you make that palatable? You eat bacon for breakfast, mayonnaise for dinner, and lettuce for lunch and you rotate that round day in, day out, and it becomes wearisome fairly soon. When you do it with children, you can do it because parents can force the child to eat what they wish him or her to eat. But doing it with adults is much more difficult because it requires a, a lot of discipline. So it's thought that it could not be done in adults. Uh, you need both uh, palatable food and simplicity to make it work. The way the 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 ratio diets were done was that you had to shop for foods that were uh, that had specific fat content and uh, carbohydrate content. You had to weigh the food for uh, grams of carbohydrates, grams of fat, and you had to prepare spe spe uh, specific recipes Again, calculating the contents of carbohydrates and fat and calories uh, and uh, weighing the foods in preparation. So it's very complicated uh, and takes a lot of time, both for shopping and for food preparation. So it's not simple. Nevertheless, uh, it has been successfully applied in children. In 2000, in the first decade of uh, this century, it started to be applied in adults also. And there have been a uh, few developments over the last, like I said, 10 to 15 years that have made it more possible for us to use this diet in adults now also. A chief development has been the recognition of what it takes to create food that is palatable and yet has that high, very high content of fat. Uh, in their calories. Uh, so there have been now a number of cookbooks that have uh, started up with ketogenic diet recipes. 
uh, and a number of companies that can make ketogenic diet recipes as well as ketogenic diet food products. Uh, uh, so that has made it easier. So the diet now is being applied to adults as well as, as children, although children, uh, the use in children is much more prevalent than the use in uh, adults. Uh, how effective is the diet? When you look at the studies, there, there are case series, and in children there are randomized studies whereby children are treated at first with uh, either the diet or standard of care, and after several months, let us say four months, the standard of care children go on the diet, those studies show that the diet is effective. You have approximately, give or take, 30 to 50 percent of children and adults who have seizure frequency reduction by about 50 percent. The studies in adults have been far fewer and far smaller than in children, and they have not so far been randomized. So the data for adults is not as well developed as the data for children. But broadly speaking, it's very similar. So I'm going to talk about both in the same uh, context. Uh, approximately 20% of people with epilepsy that is very difficult to treat may have 75% or better seizure frequency reduction. And approximately 10% of patients may either become seizure free or have 90% seizure, seizure, seizure frequency reduction or better. These are all patients who have by and large failed all other treatment. So they've been on numerous medications some of them have had surgical treatment for epilepsy, and yet the seizures have continued. It is then remarkable that perhaps 10% of them may have this dramatic seizure frequency reduction or seizure freedom. And that may be 50% per, maybe 20% per, uh, of them have 75% or greater seizure frequency reduction. That is quite remarkable. The diet, furthermore, is by and large very well tolerated. It can be started in different ways. In the old days, when the experience was being gathered, is often started uh, with hospitalization and fasting. That's not commonly done now, uh, and it probably doesn't make much of a difference whether you start with, uh, uh, with a fast uh, until you get to ketosis or whether you start with uh, a ketogenic diet without fasting. Uh, during the initiation phase, patients may sometimes feel a little faint, sometimes dizzy, sometimes tired. Uh, the commonest side effects would be nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea or constipation, diarrhea and constipation being the commonest. None of these are that common and in most instances they are transient meaning they start, then they, then they stop, and the patient continues with the diet. Uh, other potential side effects include elevation of lipids. So in some studies in adults, as about a third of patients have increase in cholesterol. The same goes for children. Triglycerides, however, may either stay stable or in some studies go down. And the good cholesterol, which is called high-density lipoprotein, HDL, may go up. So that the overall, what's called cardiovascular risk ratio, the, the, the uh, risk of elevated lipids leading to cardiovascular disease, uh, is unchanged. That Cardiovascular risk ratio is the ratio of cholesterol to triglycerides and HDL. Uh, and even though cholesterol may go up in some patients, because triglycerides may go down and the good fats HDL go, goes up, uh, the ratio by and large remains unchanged. 
In some patients, you may have to treat hypercholesterolemia or increase treatment uh, in patients who've had it to start with. That's about a third of patients. Uh, however, two things are worth noting about lipids and uh, the diet. Uh, in studies that have been done for 12 months or longer, uh, again, uh, researchers at Johns Hopkins University have shown that the hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia normalizes. Uh, we have shown in a small study that in patients who do have elevated cholesterol during the treatment, the cholesterol returns back to the baseline within three months of discontinuing the diet. There are other potential side effects that are perhaps a little more serious. Uh, about 1 to 2 percent of patients may have renal stones, uh, and there's uh, a small risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia. Both of these things are worth uh, talking about in more detail. So the risk is relatively small, 1 to 2 percent, if the treatment is short, let us say one year or shorter. With longer treatment, there isn't really enough data. Uh, there's no data in adults. Uh, there's not that much data in children. But there's one study of patients, again, at Hopkins, which uh, has been the place where most studies have been done on uh, Keto, uh, ketogenic diet uh, treat, treatments for epilepsy. In one study in which children who had dramatic response to uh, ketogenic diet in terms of uh, epilepsy improvement were treated for six years or longer. And there you had approximately 20 uh, to 25 percent risk of renal stones and of bone disease, including fractures. So these uh, the these considerations are uh, important in the long-term treatment. So uh, if this diet is so very effective in some patients, how does it work? And the short answer is we don't know. Uh, within that answer, there is quite a few subtopics. So, there are several possible considerations that we have, uh, that we have uh, thought about uh, maybe 20 years ago. One, that it is the low glucose that is responsible for the improvement in seizures. Second one is that it's, that it's the ketone bodies that are responsible. Uh, when you use fatty acids for uh, energy source, they're broken down in the liver to small fragments the end of which is what's called the ketone bodies, which gives them, uh, rise to the name ketogenic diet. Ketone, ketone bodies are uh, three to five uh, carbon uh, fragments of fatty acids. Uh, there are three of them in humans, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Uh, and it is possible that they may be implicated in the anticonvulsant mechanism of ketogenic diet. Uh, this uh, has been studied very well in both animals and humans, uh, and there's evidence to suggest that uh, uh, acetoacetate in, uh, and possibly beta-hydroxybutyrate may have uh, effects on neurons that will make it less likely for uh, the animals or humans to have seizures. Uh, but the data in human is very uh, inconclusive. Uh, there have been studies that have shown no correlation between blood levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate and uh, uh, seizure control. Uh, the third per suggestion early on was caloric restriction, and the, uh, in the early versions of the diet, uh, the diet was delivered with uh, restriction of calories. Uh, that is now commonly not done, and so probably caloric restriction is not involved. More recently, there have been uh, a number of hypotheses proposed that are based on the change in metabolism by the cell uh, when the energy source uh, is switched from carbohydrate to fat. When that occurs, the energy metabolism becomes more efficient, and there is more production of the energy blocks that's used by cells for all building of uh, cell 
replacement of uh, molecules, building of new molecules, that energy block is called ATP. When fat is used for energy instead of carbohydrates, there's more ATP produced. And that can result in several things. One, uh, ATP production is linked to production of a neurochemical called GABA, which has inhibitory effect on neurons. And one possibility which has not been uh, shown uh, uh, is that you may have increased GABA leading to increased inhibition of neurons and lesser susceptibility to seizures. Second possibility is that the increased ATP affects ion channels called ATP-linked uh, potassium channels that play an important part in determining the electrical potential of the cell and when more ATP is round, that potential goes in a direction that makes it more difficult for the cells to fire and be active. Third possibility is that the increased ATP leads to increase in the breakdown production of ATP, which is called uh, a molecule called aden adenosine, uh, which may also act on neurons in an inhibitory way. Adenosine is an interesting compound. It accumulates uh, uh, with increased wakefulness and is one of the triggers uh, for sleep initiation. And in, in seizures, the intense activity that accompanies uh, seizures, uh, the intense neuronal activity that accompanies seizures, leads to adenosine buildup. And one hypothesis of how seizures may be stopped uh, spontaneously is that adenosine buildup leads to a disruption of the seizure. Uh, yet another proposed mechanism is that the ketone bodies alter the way how another neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is responsible for excitatory effect on neurons, uh, how that neurotransmitter is uh, taken up in compartments within the neuron called uh, vesicles, which then deliver it to the end of the neuron, the, the synapse, for release into the synapse and then influence of neurons around it. And there is evidence to suggest that the uptake of glutamate into these vesicles is inhibited by ketone bodies. So there's been a lot of work on how, on trying to discover how a uh, ketogenic diet may work but none of these hypotheses have been uh, definitely proven. Uh, the ultimate goal of this research is to create what's called the ketogenic diet in a pill, uh, for a reason that I'll come to in a, in a minute. Uh, and there have been significant advances in that respect. We now have ketone esters that can be taken orally that are produced uh, commercially uh, that produce ketosis, but we have not yet reach the point where we have the ketogenic diet in pill. So why do we need ketogenic diet in pill? Well, if the diet is so effective, why is not everyone using it? It is used in children, maybe in thousands of children, in adults, probably more like in hundreds, so a few thousand adults, out of population of worldwide 50, 60 million people. About 1% of uh, the world population has epilepsy, including in the US. Uh, in the US, it's probably about 3 million of people with epilepsy. Of those, about a third have refractory epilepsy, not responsive to medication, so that's roughly speaking 350,000 uh, patients. And of those, only a small fraction will be treated with ketogenic diet. Why is that? Because it is difficult to both do and to sustain. We did a study of ketogenic diet with adults, and approximately only one in three adults whom we thought would be eligible for the study, having horrible epilepsy and having all the criteria that uh, made us think that this would be a worthwhile thing to try, only one, of th one in three of those patients agreed to do the diet. 
And the reasons why they declined were A, restriction of diet. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. In patients with horrible epilepsy, their lives are restricted. They cannot drive. Often they can't work. Often they may have trouble with family and relationships. So the life is very restricted. And food is one of the few pleasures that is not restricted. So to ask somebody in that situation to take on yet another restriction to their life is not easy. So that was a major reason. Second reason is the challenge of doing it. I, I said that uh, you need to calculate the content of carbohydrates, the content of fat. You need to take that into account when you shop for food, when you pre uh, prepare the recipes, when you prepare the food. All of that requires a lot of patience and cognitive know-how. And in children, epilepsy may affect the cognitive functioning of the child. It often does play with bad epilepsy. But the parents are not affected. So they can prepare the food. With adults, with adults with bad epilepsy, they may also have cognitive impairment. But in their situation, it is them, them themselves who prepare the food. And they may not be cognitively able to do so. Uh, the third reason, which was relatively rare, is cost. Uh, yes, it does cost more to do the ketogenic diet than to do regular food, uh, but not by that much. But these, these are the two main reasons. So it's a tough sell to patients with bad epilepsy, particularly to adults. That's one reason. The second reason is that uh, the diet is difficult to sustain. Uh, and in both children and adults, uh, they, there's a relatively high rate of discontinuation of the diet. Uh, so in adults, in, the, in a review of studies uh, that we did, uh, approximately 50% of patients discontinue the diet by the end of the study, and the, the adult studies have been uh, 3 to uh, 12 months long. Uh, if you follow the patients long term, uh, as we have tried to do in a study, uh, then the discontinuation is even greater. Uh, by the end of the first year, you've got about 30% of patients still on the diet. By the end of second year, maybe 15%. By the end of third and fourth year, just over 5%. And if those patients then stop the diet, the seizures return in adults. I'll come back to children in a minute because the story may be different in children. But in adults, it appears that seizures return when you stop the diet. So uh, if you've got a lifelong disease like epilepsy and you have uh, a low likelihood of sustaining the diet, then it is a challenge. Uh, why do patients discontinue the diet? for two main reasons. Culinary restriction, uh, and all humans find it difficult to be restricted. And if you're restricted day in, day out with what you, uh, what you can eat, uh, then it becomes a problem. Uh, I've had patients who've done really well on this, uh, and maybe two years into it, they say, doctor, I can't do it anymore. Number two, social restriction. So patients with epilepsy stand out they have a stigma of epilepsy. Imagine that you have that, you go to a restaurant or to a party with friends, and all of a sudden you cannot drink alcohol, which you can't with ketogenic diet. You cannot drink normal soda, which you can't do. But more importantly, you can't eat normal food. You take out your uh, packaged salad, and people look at you and say, what's the matter with you? Ketogenic diet is not universally accepted in our society at the moment. And so when patients go into a social setting, dining out with friends or families, social events, parties, and they follow the ketogenic diet, they draw attention to themselves and they feel more out of society than uh, they would do if they act normally. 
So these two things uh, lead to high discontinu discontinuation of the diet. And that includes patients who've done very well. So uh, we track patients with seizure frequency reduction of 75% or more, and they had the same rates of discontinuation as patients uh, with ketogenic diet overall. So those are some of the child challenges uh, of ketogenic diet. But that said, it is an extremely enticing form of treatment for patients who are willing to do it the response is quick uh, so for sure within uh, two months likely within days so what you can do and that's what uh, we do is bring it in, into discussion for patients with refractory epilepsy as one of the treatment options and then if patients try it and they have good response then they can make an informed decision whether or not to continue with it and there are some patients who do continue with it and there are some patients who continue with it for years and it has turned their life lives around so it's a very interesting exciting form of treatment with challenges but very very worthwhile pursuing in the clinic